uh, Professor Mark De Smit. Uh, Mark has been uh, one of the, the really leading names in, in research in uveitis and, and has been a, a friend for many years. And uh, Mark has always a very uh, you know, amazing ideas about uh, disease processes and, in, and management issues. And uh, we're very much uh, happy that he agreed to talk to us and I thank him for that. So, uh, Mark, thank you, and he's going to talk to us about inflammation involving the choroidal stroma. Well, thank you very much. We'll be talking now about choroidal stroma and inflammatory disease uh, uh, that can be present there. So, my name is Mark Desmet. I'm an ophthalmologist based in Lausanne, Switzerland. Now, if you're confronted with this picture, for example, where we're seeing these deep lesions within the choroid, maybe some involving the retina, or this one here, it may be somewhat difficult to decide exactly what's going on. And if you look at both, there are some similarities between the two. The first is sympathetic ophthalmia. This, as you can read up there, is a form of um, um, benign uh, lymphoid hyperplasia, a form of lymphoma. And so I think it's very important to have in one's mind an approach to looking at choroidal inflammatory disease. And the easiest way is to use something that you probably know is to separate them between infectious, non-infectious, and masquerade syndromes. And within the non-infectious, there are systemic causes, sarcoidosis, and there are those that are purely ocular. For example, VKH, sympathetic ophthalmia, we just mentioned, birdshot or multifocal choroiditis. It's also useful to try and classify the response. If it's antibody complexes, they cause vasculitis or vascular occlusions. T cells can give you vasculitis, but also choroiditis or retinitis. It depends on the type of antigen. If it's uh, retina-based, it's going to be more in the retina. If we have a melanin-based uh, antigen, it may be more choroidal, as we see in VKH and sympathetic. B cells can give you a more chronic disease, often leading to some fibrosis, and macrophages are involved, obviously, in granulomatous disease, whether it's infectious, such as tuberculosis, or, for example, in sarcoidosis. Active choroidal disease tends to give you increased thickness as there are inflammatory cells that come in there. And once the disease has uh, run its course and you see more damage, it leads to thinning. Thinning then can be visible as disappearance of vessels in very thin areas uh, that are atrophic. The structural changes may be present in the choroid. There'll be altered vasculature, particularly in a, a scarring phase, but you can also have displacement of vessels when you have granulomas that form, particularly if these are large, as you might see, for example, with um, uh, tuberculosis. Also, if the choroid is involved, the neighboring structures may be affected. We may see retinal edema or macular edema, for example, or exudations such as a subretinal fluid elevation, which is very common, for example, with VKH in its very early stages. Now, autofluorescence can help you differentiate these scarring events, the ones that have occurred in the past and the ones that are active. And this, these images here, I think, are very good for that. Above you see scars, they're sort of white, very well demarcated on the left in the color image, and they give you a, depending on the type of autofluorescence you're using, a darker image uh, on the autofluorescent image. Below you see an active lesion. That lesion is a lot uh, more indistinct in terms of its borders, and it gives you a, a whiter appearance to the uh, autofluorescence. Next to it, a bit further down to the right, uh, to the left here, we have in fact what might be a form still of an active lesion, but when we look at autofluorescence, it's now dark and black, which indicates that this is in fact a scar. What about this picture? Hopefully you've recognized this as a disease that isn't seen, does not cause much uh, the presence of many cells inside the vitreous. We see very well the retina. We see these blotchy areas that are involving the deeper structures. And so this could be, for example, birdshot. And the fluorescein won't necessarily show you very much. And on this ICG, you find that the retinal vessels are perfectly OK. But in the choroid, we're seeing areas of hypocyanescence, areas that don't really stain very much. And the vasculature of the choroid has decreased, which indicates here that we have an active disease with choroidal involvement with granulomas, but also leakage from all the vessels that are present, and we have an active choroidal vasculitis. And the presence of 
um, uh, granulomas inside of a, a birdshot lesion has been shown several years ago uh, in the early uh, 2010. So ICG is in fact very useful. We talk about, about a lot about OCTA as being a useful approach, but really the best one for choroid is looking at either the uh, enhanced depth imaging, and we'll come back to that, but ICG is, uh, is crucial. It allows you to identify a number of active lesions as being areas that form sort of granulomas that are hypocyanescent. Um, and the larger ones tend to persist into the late phase, like, but smaller ones tend to sort of disappear and fade out as you go through the ICG phase. And you should look at images that go out at about 30 minutes. Scars tend to remain constant in their appearance and they don't really color later on. And, but while ICG is good to determine the presence of activity, it's not all that good to monitor. And you can see this in the central images on the... Uh, right you can see on the left you can see how the image is changing in this choroidal granuloma it's decreasing in size posterior anteriorly as you can see on the right and in the middle the reason why there is a little difference is that in fact most of the change is not along the periphery of the lesion but really the very center of it where it comes in contact with the choriocapillaris and the rpe now, an important thing to realize is that granulomas inside the choroid disappear posterior anteriorly, while the ones that are present inside the retina, and in particular the choriocapillaris, tend to disappear antero posteriorly. And this is often what is being mentioned as the means by which uh, granulomas disappear inside the retina, but it is somewhat different in this specific, uh, if we're talking about the choroid. Let's talk about some etiologies, and I know we've talked already about infections, but let me mention Mycobacterium chimera in passing. This one used to be called Avium intracellulare, very similar to TB. It gives you these tiny little lesions, not very large choro choroidal lesions. Um, it can involve the retina, but often causes a vasculitis, and it's associated with uh, major organ transplantation. So combinations of uh, lung, heart, or lung, liver transplants, you may end up seeing this, and it has to do with contamination of the equipment used to maintain these patients alive uh, just after their transplant. You are all aware of BCG immunotherapy for bladder CA, and commonly you'll see granulomas form uh, inside the anterior chamber, but there is a report of these very deep lesions as seen here in, this, uh, in B at the level of the choroid. So BCG immunization can give you a granulomatous disease of the choroid. Syphilis very, very rarely will give you a granuloma. It's usually associated with changes that are more anterior at the level of the pigment uh, epithelium and uh, the retina, but they have been described, and, uh, and you can see one of these uh, images here. It responds very nicely to penicillin. More commonly, we talk usually of the posterior placoid chorioretinitis. This does not cause really a choroiditis. It causes an inflammation of the choriocapillary, and that's what you find on the uh, uh, OCT. Moving over now to masquerade syndromes, I mentioned earlier unilateral lymphoid hyperplasia. We know that this is a, a marginal B-cell lymphoma of very low grade. You see the pathologic image on the left. It causes discoloration as can be seen in the uh, left-hand image of the fundus. Thickening that can be present within the uh, choroid or sometimes also at the outside of the sclera. It tends to progress very slowly, doesn't necessarily require treatment initially, and responds very well to a radiotherapy, and usually present in men over 50 years of age. Now, sarcoid granulomas can form because of chemotherapy, for example, checkpoint inhibitors, but also the BRAV and MEC uh, modifiers, immunomodifiers. It's very uh, commonly is associated with either prembazizumab or nivolumab, PD-1 or PDL2 uh, inhibitors, and so it's important to be aware of that. But maybe you should also be aware of the fact that in cancers, you can have an associated sarcoid granuloma, and it is mainly associated with leukemias and lymphomas, but it has been described with other forms of adenocarcinomas, either from the breast or from the uh, lung in particular. What about systemic? Well, you'll recognize sarcoidosis in this case, and very often it can involve the retina, uh, leading to the, uh, these typical candle wax drippings. 
But this case here involves mainly the choroid, and you can see again that the ICG is a very good way to be able to define where the involvement of the choroid is present, the granulomas, seen on enhanced depth imaging. And the reason in part I showed this one is because you'll see the indentation of the retina I spoke to earlier, and over time, over six months time, below is the initial image, above is a follow-up image taken at the same location, and you can see that the granuloma is progressively uh, disappearing. It's not quite gone, but it has uh, significantly decreased. And another granuloma here is again nearly completely gone several months later. VKH is probably the prototypical disease that involves the, uh, the choroid. Initially, it'll give you, of course, the headache, these pinpoint lesions on the floor scene, as seen here on the left. And what you'll see very quickly is choroidal thickening. And in this case, treatment very aggressively with very high dose steroids, and I mean up to two milligrams per kilogram, is important if you want to stop the disease. Starting with a lower dose of steroids is fine. The uh, serous detachment will disappear, but you'll have to associate it very quickly with the non-steroidal if you want to get improvement, mycophenolate or another, if you want to be able to get rid of this disease completely. Otherwise, you can of course use biologic agents and Humira works very well, but with Humira beware, you need a prolonged treatment. This patient did very well. The original um, uh, uh, a disease disappeared. We had a subretinal uh, inflammation, as you can see here. Um, but then when she stopped about a year later, it recurred as it was present uh, initially. And this is rather different than what we saw previously because overt recurrence in the posterior pole was very uncommon. This is an old slide I had from about 15 years ago. While recurrences, if you get chronicity, tends to involve the anterior segment, causing you these iris nodules, as well as a granulomatous disease. So here's this patient. We can see that we have an initial thickened choroid. It decreases with treatment. She stops her treatment, and uh, shortly after, it becomes, again, uh, increased thickness in the choroid. And she starts to develop these little types of uh, folds inside the retina. And within a few days, five days, she gets a recurrent detachment. We responded very well to Emira. She stayed on another two years on Emira and then was able to wean off. Chronicity in VKH leads to shallow anterior chamber, increased pressure, acute glaucoma, and of course the most important uh, manifestation is depigmentation, the sunset glow appearance inside the retina, which leads in fact to a severe problem with glare, and it is often the reason why these patients are virtually blind at the end of their life. So in VKH it's very important, be extremely aggressive in the beginning, and if you start seeing the pigmentation that starts usually peripherally, you need to increase the amount of immunosuppression you give, because otherwise, when these patients read about 60, 70 years of age, they'll be essentially blind. Other disease, very similar, again directed against a pigment, the melanin, a tyrosinase protein. This is sympathetic ophthalmia. And here also, if you can recognize these depigmentations early on in the process, you'll be able to stop this pathology in its uh, infancy before it reaches this stage, at which, in fact, even with high-dose uh, non-steroidals, uh, cyclosporin, the use of um, FK506 or, or serolimus, we won't really be able to st stop the progression of the disease. I've had a patient that had ocular trauma. Within about a month, she developed some lesions in her contralateral eye that were looking typical, similar to this, active lesions. And on high-dose steroids for about two months, we stopped the process completely. And five years later, there was absolutely no evidence of sympathetic. So if you suspect sympathetic, high-dose uh, treatment, and you may get an improvement. This is multifocal choroiditis, punctate inner choroidopathy, PIC, are two similar diseases. They affect the posterior pole. Here's a case of PIC. The previous one was more multifocal. They have these small lesions, often more in the nasal side for PIC. Both are associated with neovascularization of the macula, which will respond to anti-VEGF, but more importantly, will respond also to non-steroidal. Uh, I mean, to uh, the use of medications for the inflammation. We do see thickening of the choroid in this disease, but as you can see the process here over the first visit up left and the lower visit after eight months, the thinning is, is not complete. And we don't see most of the time complete thinning in any of these diseases, but you can monitor response to therapy by looking at the thickness of the choroid. 
This is one of my cases, neovascular membrane, did not want any treatment, and so when she came, she had a massive increase in her choroid. She did respond to some intravitreal treatment to get rid of the, the neovascularization, but there was no change in the choroidal level. And again, choroidal neovascularization in this disease is what you want to recognize. Bichette's disease can also give you an increase in choroidal thickness. Um, this may be, in fact, a better way to monitor response to treatment than just the fluorescein, uh, if you're able to see the back of the eye. And you can see here the difference between the two. On the right, the choroid certainly gives you a better impression of, of the response to therapy. And with regards to birdshot, we've already talked about the importance of looking at both the, the choroidal circulation, where we saw vasculitis, Vasculitis can obviously also be present in the retina. They can be happening at the same time, but often there's a discrepancy between the two. The ICG can show you these lesions and active disease, even in the presence of less disease inside the retina. So in conclusion, choroid can be the primary or secondary target of disease. Vascular leakage, granuloma formation, and the thickening of the choroid are the things you want to look for. Consider a broad differential diagnosis because choroid is part of the systemic circulation. The inner layer of the choroid, I didn't have time to talk about that, Sattler's layers is most affected by these inflammatory processes. And um, the purely ocular diseases, as have we talked about VKH and sympathetic, required hard, strong inhibition early and for a sufficient amount of time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark.